talk about is something that um, I haven't seen anybody else talk about, and I might find in the next 20 minutes that there's a reason for that. Um, <laughs> but <clears throat> basically, th there's a lot of good talks out there about general advice to, for what to do 99% of the time. Um, I haven't seen anybody talk about what to do the 1% of the time that you have no idea what's going on. Um, and so I wanted to give, give that a go and maybe, maybe it won't work out, maybe it will, but um, let's give it a try. Um, you'll have to forgive me if I'm a little bit hoarse because I'm just getting over a cold. Okay, so to begin with, I wanted to define what I consider to be the box in the phrase talk, talking, uh, thinking outside the box. Um, I, in, the mo in the broadest sense, it's a thinking space which is confined to, by, by some conditions. Um, I think of the box as being a confinement you place on yourself um, when you're thinking most of the time, um, due to the simple fact that you have experiences and you have general knowledge um, that influences the way that you think. And most of the time, that's a good thing because um, otherwise you'd be deriving every single solution from first principles and it'd, it'd take you a week to set up a user account or something. Um, so I don't really consider thinking inside the box to be thinking, if you know what I mean. It's more just following a logical conclusion from some um, some known facts or experiences. Um, so why think outside the box? As I said, usually thinking inside the box gets you there quicker and faster. Most of the time you actually want to think inside the box because you'll get a request like, please, um, I'm with Anchor and we do hosting, so I'll, most of this will be web hosting oriented. You get a request like set up a new website or a new user account or something, and you know how to do that. You don't want to have to read a textbook on how to use Linux to be able to set up a user account, and that's what the box gives you. Um, and that's why we, we write scripts to automate so much of the inbox thinking, because we don't want to manually run the same set of commands over and over again. Um, but it's important to know when to step outside the box, and I'm gonna stop using this analogy soon because I, it's getting annoying to say the box over and over again. Um, <laughs> But it, it's good to know when to leave the box and start thinking um, in ways you might not have thought before. Um, so the, the way I'm going to approach this is, because I'm trying to talk about the 1% of exception cases where you don't know what's going on, it's difficult to um, give, talk about general principles. So I'll approach it from a point of view of giving some examples which are, they're based on real world events, but I've adapted them for the points I want to make for this talk. Um, and then I'll look at those, um, look at those examples and say um, what it is that they can show us about thinking outside the box. So scenario one, you run a web server that is being DDoSed by a very large number of remote IP addresses um, and they are randomly generating their user agents to look kind of like real web browsers. Um, and the customer obviously wants their website to be up, and it's not up because it's getting DDoSed. Um, so this, this is a fairly simple one to start off with. Um, a reasonable solution to this is to write a script that looks at the access log for um, the user agents associated with a particular IP address, and then block those IP addresses, block IP addresses using more than some predefined number of user agents um, from accessing the service. Um, and a fairly obvious drawback with this is that it tends to have a lot of false positives. Um, you have a lot of large organizations which use um, NAT or web proxies and so forth, and you will naturally, it, unless they have some standard browser that everybody in their organization is using, you're going to get a lot of user agents coming from that address. And if you're um, ba blocking that address based on the, the number of user agents, you're gonna hit false positives. However, the alternative is to do nothing at all and to have the site accessible for nobody at all because the DDoS attacks are um, making it unusable. So the conclusion that I would draw from that is um, there are cases where a perfect solution is not possible um, and you want something that's going to solve the problem 90% of the way 
maybe not the extra 10%, but you don't have a 100% solution. So between 90% and 0%, you want to take the 90%. Um, that's a fairly basic case to start off. Does anyone have any questions about that specifically before we go on to, yep? Uh, yes, we can assume for, sorry? Ah, right. Um, the question was, um, we know it's an actual, D do we know it's an actual DDoS and not the customer misinterpreting legitimate traffic? Um, for the purpose of this example, we can assume that it's an actual DDoS because that suits the conclusion I'm drawing from it. Um, <laughs> but yes, that, that would be a valid thing to check in, a re in an actual situation like this. Um, scenario number two, and this is where I'm, it gets a bit more interesting, at least for me. Um, so you're migrating a few hundred gigabytes of static assets from one host to another with faster disks. The reason being that the customer is about to have an enormous increase in uh, number of requests, and they're concerned that the uh, they're rightfully concerned that the disks on the old hosts are likely not going to keep up. However, you, you're operating on fairly short notice, and you realize that you're not going to have all of their content copied across to the machine with the faster disks in time for the traffic spike. Um, this is a tricky one to solve because you can leave them on the old host and have everything die when the traffic hits and the old host can't keep up, or you can move them to the new host and some files will be missing. Um, so I would, in this case, I would go about it by taking a third option, um, which is slightly horrible. Um, configure the web server on the new host to look for a, a file locally, and if it doesn't find one, proxy pass the request through to the old server, um, such that you get the benefit of the new disks for any files that have been copied across, and hopefully the number of requests that don't hit files that have already been placed on the new server will be low enough that the um, the deficiencies in the disk speed on, is that a question? Well, can you use an atomic copying mechanism so that they don't get past the spike? Um, yes, that would be a like reason. Like yeah. Yep. Um, so, you, in this case, you then continue copying files with an atomic mechanism. Um, and the, the, the nice thing about this solution is that over time you gradually get better and better performance on average because more and more of the files are getting off the old disks. Oh, but sorry, in what way would it get worse? Well, because for a while you had two hosts sending the files through. I mean, you know, it, it might be that it's a little bit better in the middle. So you had twice as many disks spindles around. Ah, right. Yeah, I see what you're going. Um, yeah, I suppose it depends on. I suppose it depends on how much worse the disk performance is on the old server. Um, and yeah, feel free to keep interrupting me with questions. <laughs> yeah. Um, also, if you're using expectation proxy, you didn't get the same performance. Um, if if you were to cache it, yes. Um, in a situation like this, I would say that's a bit more effort. To, given that it's a temporary solution, it's probably a bit more effort than it's worth, unless you happen to have a config ready to go that you know is going to work properly for, for caching, but yet yeah, that, that, um, that would also be a reasonable solution. Um, the analysis of this is, first of all, that it's a really ugly hack. It's not something I would want to put in production under ideal circumstances, um, but the whole point of this talk is it's about the 1% of circumstances that are not ideal and that you don't expect. Um, so it's a kind of a compromise in that you're putting in place a solution you don't really want to because there's nothing better to put in place. Um, it adds an, a dependency on another web server. It's another moving part in the system that um, people have to consider if they're troubleshooting. It's not really supportable. Um, but given the strict time constraints that we need this in place by a given time when we're going to get a traffic spike, it's the least of three evils because it's the only solution that both continues to serve all assets and gives the best possible perform performance for the assets that it can. Um, and in more generally, so I, I have a separate slide at the end of each scenario with some kind of general conclusion. Um, in this case, 
um, sometimes you can't satisfy every requirement with a good solution. Um, so sometimes it's necessary to satisfy every requirement with a bad solution, like in this case. Um, yeah, and it would be a good, uh, as I've noted here, it would be a good idea to see if we can change the requirements in the case where we know a traffic spike is coming and we can't do anything about it, the requirements are not really that easy to change. Right, uh, scenario number three. You man suppose you manage a system that uses a shared NFS file system as temporary storage to pass files from um, one system to another. And I won't go into the details because it's not relevant to the scenario, but say the NFS server experiences um, performance issues that are bad enough that they're blocking for this process. And this process is um, crucial to the functionality of the website that depends on it, um, such that the website is down as a direct result of this happening. Um, so the, the conventional way of looking at this and the, the way that to me feels natural to look at it is we have a component in the system that is broken and let's fix that component. Um, but the NFS server is, um, is having problems that are going to take quite some time to fix, and in the meantime, the website that depends on this stuff is not available. Um, so the solution I have for that is replace NFS with HTTP. Um, set up a web server on the nodes transferring the files across and have them communicate out of band um, using Redis or whatever it is that you want to use to have a queue of files to fetch, um, to fetch those files to, over HTTP and completely bypass the disks on the NFS server. Um, so to, to look at um, what it is we're doing here, fixing NFS would have taken hours or days. Um, bypassing NFS takes 20, 30 minutes. You just change the code to um, I mean, most web applications use languages that have readily available HTTP libraries that you can plug them into. Um, so you can tell the web app, just go and fetch this stuff over HTTP instead of NFS. Um, and ultimately, um, if you're doing web hosting, you're getting paid to keep websites up. You're not getting paid to maintain the specific backend that um, the website is using. Um, so cutting out a malfunctioning component satisfies the goal of keeping the website up. You can then go and fix that component later when it's not causing an outage. Um, and the, the general conclusion I want to draw from this um, is that it's much too easy to try and fix the root cause. We tend, in general, as sysadmins, to, um, to want to fix things correctly, going to the root cause and stopping it from causing any other problems. Um, in some cases, that's not the best first thing to do. Um, as much as I'm, as I'm as big a fan of root cause analysis and fixing as anyone else, but when you need to, um, when it's causing a problem in another system that's significantly more critical, um, you sometimes need to make a compromise and say, we'll put this root cause analysis aside and just fix it horribly and in a really ugly way for the time being. Some people would say that using NFS was the root cause. <laughs> Sorry? Wouldn't it be more satisfying to hunt down the NFS fault and, and, and shout at them and get them off it? Yeah. Um, possibly, if that's what's causing the problems. Um, I'm deliberately leaving, leaving the problems non-specific here because the, um, it's not relevant to the scenario. So if that was the problem, then yes, that would um, be quite satisfying. But <laughs> so you make the point that um, the root cause analysis is to try and it, um, or is, uh, is followed by fixing the, miss, the broken component rather than trying to fix the system as a whole. But I think you, you, you're reading your example, and as Rob makes the joke, but it's totally true. Like the NFS is the broken component. I'm just joking. I'm joking. Rob's not joking. He's telling the truth. It's the, the system was badly designed to start with, and replacing the bad component was necessary anyway. Even if you put in a quick hack to say we're going to do HTTP fetches to get rid of the broken component, it's probably the case that that component should never be there in the first place. 
Um, yeah, that's, I'll repeat the question in a moment because it's what I intended to say anyway. Um, so, uh, um, what you've said is basically what I should have just said um, in my conclusion here, but I said fix the missing component rather than fix the system as a whole, so you're correct there. What, um, what Jamie says is that um, we should look at fixing the entire system rather than the missing compo component, as if the missing component if, if the existence of the missing component is the root cause, um, then taking that out is going to fix the system. And that's, um, I completely agree with that, and that's the message I'm trying to get across, in fact. Yep. How did you go from having that issue and then jump into this will be uh, too hard for me to fix, it's going to take hours, and I'll implement something else that will take half an hour, even though I don't know that it'll take half an hour? Which I do. Um, well, that, that, I mean, there's a... Um, to, to a large extent, it, I, I did say this was going to be probably to be difficult because nobody talks about it, and there's probably a reason. This is probably why, because you kind of have to um, use your intuition a bit, and then sometimes your intuition will fail, and you're correct. You, you'll put in place something that you think is going to take about 30 minutes, and it's going to take six hours or, or six weeks or something. Um, and then you, it's difficult to come up with a rule of thumb because after 30 minutes, you might say it's going to only to take another five minutes. You, you, um, need a, you need a drop of time, so you need to say, I know that this task that I'm pretty sure won't complete in time will take one, so if I can do it properly, it'll take this long. Therefore, the, 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 they have a significant benefit of doing that in that, but I'm going to unwind at a later point. I need to know that it'll Um, yep. Um, yep. So, so the um, statement, more so than a question, was you need a um, drop-dead time where you say, I'm going to give myself this long to implement the solution, and if it's not, if the ugly hack is not finished by this time, I'm going to drop it and work on something else. Is, is that an adequate summary of yeah, writing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's that, that's fair. Um, so the the the, um, the comment was, um, you're still relying on your experience in the sense that you um, if you if you find that the performance. <laughs> The, the, the <laughs> it's okay, the, 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 um, the AI in that isn't a very good player anyway. Um, the comment was it, that you're still using the experience because if, say, the performance is slow because of a bad disk, um, you know from experience how long that's likely to take to repair. Um, so yes, the, the, no thought is ever completely in isolation. Um, the way I'm kind of trying to use out the term out of the box here is, um, maybe putting together two pieces of experience in a way that you haven't before, or something along those lines, as, a as opposed to solving a problem just in the, in the way that you've solved another problem in the past. Um, but yes, yeah, so, um, there's never any case where you're ever going to have any kind of thought that's not impacted by some experience. Yeah? Um, in, I think the question was asking, what, how do you know when it's time to stop debugging the NFS server and do something different? Um, Maybe your team has an SLA for triaging a, a root cause, and if you exceed some time, like maybe it's 15 minutes, you haven't figured out what's going on, and it's time to involve other people. As, as a lone or call person, you should be able to call out to your manager and other people to say, I don't know what's going on anymore. Maybe if you need some help debugging it, or at that point your boss is saying, this customer is losing dollars, and it's you know this much per minute, so we need to brainstorm an idea how we can work around the problem rather than try and fix it straight away. 
Um, yes, I don't know. I don't know, quite know how to summarize that for the. Um, uh, go on. Uh, sure, why not? <laughs> um, I shaved, I don't have any way to attach it. <laughs> so, sometimes you need to say, if I can't work this out in a few minutes, I'm going to have to ask for help. Um, we all like to think we can solve every problem uh, ourselves and quickly at that. Uh, a good uh, a good example is like for scenario one, maybe it's not your fault to fix the DDoS, why don't you go and uh, bring in Cloudflare or something um, and have and get somebody who, like get the help of a company who deals with DDoSing every day and just put that in front of the website, you know. It, sometimes you need to ask for help. Right, um, was that a reasonable summary of what you were, ask, what you were saying, do you think? Okay, I think I'm out of time. Um, since I'm the last speaker, is it that big a deal? Yes um, and no. <laughs>